It gives me great pleasure to introduce Malcolm, who is not only um, a very close friend and dear colleague and lovely things, um, who has, has, has been coming to this conference since the first day, the first one, yeah, yeah. and yeah. apparently is one of the few people, David being <coughs> one of the others, I have established. You've, you've checked. I've checked. <laughs> who has presented something every single year. And this, there is no exception, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> and uh, Malcolm is currently a lecturer in the University of Northampton in counselling psychology, transpersonal psychology and sports psychology. He's been interested in sport for a very long time as well, but is mm -hmm. less so now, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, a major yes. focus for his life has been to follow the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and he was co-founder of a Buddhism psychology psychiatry group. You say in the 1980s, but if it's the one I joined, it was in the 1990s. No, it was, it was in the early 80s. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, it's one of, the, one of the first, really. Oh, mm -hmm. excellent. Another major focus in his life are his three grown-up children and his three grandchildren, of which I've heard a lot about. <laughs> Over the years, Malcolm has internationally run workshops on the application of Buddhism and for its use in the helping professions. So he's done a lot of good things. He always gives us very good value. And without further ado, I hand you over to Malcolm. Okay, thank you very much. I don't need this, do I? Kendall, I don't need this, do I? No, right. Right, okay. So, it's always um, a, a, gr a great pleasure and a great honour to present to this conference, which is a, very much a world leader in its own right. And... Um, um, I, I, I got a text actually at two o'clock in the morning from uh, she who obviously never sleeps <laughs> saying wouldn't it be a good idea anyway here we are and um, I was not long after coming back from a Buddhist course, course really uh, in all, uh, last month and um, so really this is what emerged from that and it's quite a different kind of take which I did over the last three years really which is very much about looking at gender and spirituality and challenging uh, challenging things in that area and um, I've always been a great fan of Darwin and always been a great fan of Wallace as well speaking of which I saw speaking of Wallace or mentioning Wallace I saw an interview by a great favourite of mine Alan Wallace um, it was on a, on a body body and balance channel, which is mainly mainly give to for, for women of a certain age interested in yoga and Pilates. But he was on there, and he's in he was in um, he's in Britain at the moment, I think, or very recently. And he he mentioned um, that he was very uh, disgruntled as a youngster in California in the in the nineteen sixties whereby he couldn't reconcile his Protestant Christian upbringing. I think his father was a pastor, with a name like Wallace, I think there's a strong Scottish link there, Protestant pastor, and with his interest in modern science and his interest in ecology in particular. And as those of you may know about uh, Alan Wallace, he's got a very excellent website. He was a, an ordained monk of the Tibetan tradition, which, as you'll see, is very much what I'm steeped in. And um, recently he's written books on um, physics and, uh, and, and Mahayana Buddhism and, and so forth. Um, but basically he was very dis disenchanted with these two worlds. The separate world of religion, in his case a Christian tradition, and the separate world, the modern world of science. And speaking to Harold, Har it's Harold, Harry, yeah, Harry, isn't it? Just before the session, you saw the Pope yesterday in his Pope mobile, didn't you? 
And I, and, I, and I listened to his address, and I was actually quite impressed with the various things he said about his criticism of radical, um, radical scepticism. And um, so it's very relevant to our times, really, is how we integrate the transpersonal with the, sci- with the scientific. And that's why this idea came to mind, really. And what I'm saying, really, is to me, the Buddha, the Buddha is, is a great genius. He, he's a great scientific genius. To my mind, he is without par. And, of course, Darwin is seen as a genius of our time. And I really want to sort of present the view then that the Buddha really was a practitioner. He was a scientific investigator, the subject of empiricism, as uh, David said all those years ago, as I remember. <laughs> subject of it. Imp- you did. Yes, it's very good. <laughs> and, um, and made his discoveries, exactly, rather as Charles Darwin did. And so as a practitioner for me within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition for over 30 years now, a little bit of it is beginning to sink in, just a little bit, just a breaking through. And I always had a soft heart for mavericks and pioneers, and it struck me then that both Darwin, and of course the context is the recent celebrations of Darwin's um, work and his publications and so on, his birth and so on, and, um, and the Buddha both used logic and systematic investigation of the evidence they gathered in rather different ways, but it was evidence nevertheless. Um, I think Peter refers to qualia, as I remember, from quite a lot in his talks, um, to challenge the prevailing religious orthodoxy of their time and really to develop very radical views of the human condition, which were not necessarily very welcome in the societies in which they lived. But I do think they're very relevant to our present life and times. Just touching on Darwin for a second, as you know, there's been those recent celebrations, and he discovered, didn't he, a view of reality then which was very challenging to the Victorian uh, religious orthodoxy at at that time. And as those of you know, I think Darwin was interested in... (laughs) What was that? (laughs) Was that me? What were done, Kendall? Right. <laughs> Widget update. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> we are sponsored by Widget, aren't we? <laughs> There's that little sideline you've got going, Ingrid. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, and of course, uh, Darwin uh, was, I think, was interested in becoming a Christian pastor, partly so he could follow his interests in natural. Uh, in, um, in, in the natural world and so on. But his discoveries, of course, challenged that. And it was particularly disturbing for his wife, Emma, who was a devout Christian, and Charles Darwin was a devoted family man. And so, in a sense, when they say things are counterintuitive, Darwin looked at evidence, or what he saw as evidence, which challenged the orthodoxy of his time. And I do feel a little bit, that I've kind of moved from the cavaliers, the theistic cavaliers here, to the kind of slightly non-theistic roundheads uh, this time this time round, um, in, in the sense of ch- challenging things. So obviously my involvement in Mahayana Buddhism, has a, you could argue, has a strong theistic aspect as well. But the point here is that Darwin looked at what he was what the evidence he found, and he built up his view of reality around that. And, as you also probably know, that Darwinian evolution is not necessarily about going upwards in a Deshardan sort of way, Taha Deshardan sort of way, evolution of consciousness, but that, of course, may be happening, who knows? Maybe some of you do, you probably do, actually. But the, the Darwinian notion of evolution really is about... Species who are able to reproduce most effectively. And I saw a program, it was a Stephen Fry program on the blue whale, wanting to see the blue whale off the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, you know, we like, we like whales, don't we? You know, they're big and they're interesting and all that kind of thing. But with a decline in shark numbers, which my brother is a very keen, nat- his, his specialism, his lifelong specialism is in natural history, 
as he told me, there's been this huge decline in shark numbers, possibly through fi- over- overfishing and so on, and also, you know, um, killing lots of sharks. What it's given rise to are millions and trillions of millions of squid, which we don't find very beautiful. And so it's quite dodgy then to go in the sea because the trillions of squid will just peck at us because they've got beaks, haven't they? Which is not our image, is it? Of a, like we have of a blue whale. So in other words, it's not a, in other words, evolution in a Darwinian sense, as far as I understand it, is really about successful reproduction. It's not necessarily we could have the whole of our oceans full of billions of squid, couldn't we? Presumably, just end up eating each other. It's not an, not a necessarily attractive model. And also, as a Sherlock Holmes fan, as uh, many of my generation are, along with Rupert Bear, as, uh, which is something <laughs> David and me have in common, is. Um, you know, the quote from Sherlock Holmes, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, is the truth. And the truth may not be very nice. That's the point here, really. Hence, I've kind of moved a bit onto the roundhead side. And in some ways, both Charles Darwin and the Buddha implemented the above logic to their own naturalistic observations. The Buddha within himself, Darwin obviously looking at the world around him finding all these fossils and where did they come and why are they on the top of mountains and so on. Leading to unprecedented conclusions at their time about what it is to be human and what is going on in this world. As you know, Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha of two and a half thousand years ago, prince of the Shakya clan in northern India, as the tales of his life go and the stories of his life, um, he had a very protected life, kind of in Beckham Towers in Cheshire, where I first landed in the world. It was immediately instantly exported to Manchester. But, um, yeah, so that kind of Beckham Towers, you know, that wonderful, you know, God realm of, uh, of, of, of footballers' wives and so forth. Um, he was protected then, of course, until he saw a sick man, an old man in a corpse. And as the story goes, you know, it freaked him out. And interestingly, my wonderful, as Ingrid knows, uh, granddaughter, she was, she was freaked out when, about a year ago when she discovered that people died. It, this is, she was six then. When she discovered that people died. And she had, a, to my mind, it was a realisation. People die. And it, it totally shook her. Rigid. It shook her to the foundations. What's going to happen to me? And it's interesting with little children, David will appreciate this, and Ingrid have written their wonderful books for children. Um, you know, as, when I pick her up from school while she's munching away after having been to the sweetie shop, which is a compulsory visit, um, she said, just totally out of it, you know a lot about death and dying and all that sort of thing, don't you? Anyway, what happens then? Um, chomp, 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 and all that kind of thing. So I had a talk about what apparently happens at the death time, which is obviously linking to other themes in his com- conference. But she was very shaken by this. And similarly, these observations about the natural world then led the Buddha, so there's nothing new in my talk, I'm afraid, uh, led the Buddha to leave his family, seek an answer to the problems of human existence. And what really struck him then, and I still do wonder if in fact we do build up walls of defensiveness to face up to our situation really, is that the Buddha's big idea, and I could say it's a Buddhist perspective, but a Buddha, from a Buddhist perspective it's actually how it is. Um, but the levels of suffering in the world, they're just unbearably overwhelming. And the only thing I have in common with uh, Mr. Dawkins, <laughs> in agreement with him, really, is when he described, you know, at one of his programs on Darwin and evolution a couple of years ago, whenever it was, on television, and went back to his home country, well, Kenya, wasn't it? I think, African country, and went out into the jungle at night and recorded what was going on, and everything's eating everything else. It's horrid, it's hideous, it's really awful. So therefore, 
this is to my, to my mind then, but what the Buddha did, he challenged then our tendency, which is a deep tendency, isn't it, to make the best of things, which is very laudable, to see things in a positive light, which is why I'm moving into round head mode here. But basically asking that question, there's something, what's going on? What's going on in our human existence? What's going on in our world? Isn't there something really wrong here? Isn't there something not right here? And that's a hugely shaking view of our reality. And to my mind, it's one of the most powerful questions, really, which has ever been, uh, uh, ever been asked. And, of course, the Buddha went to investigate and look for natural processes, natural causes, like Darwin did, if you like, and Wallace, who's a great favourite of mine, um, and, and, who came, also came up with the theory of, of evolution, of natural selection, at, the, at more or less the same time as Darwin. And so they're looking at natural explanations, which is scientific, isn't it? It's a scientific view of what it, what's going on in our world and what it is to be human. So as you know, historically, I don't need to focus on this very much, but the Buddha tried to, to master his body following the ascetic path of self-mortification. And that was not satisfactory. So therefore, he looked through the path, through the path of introspection, uh, contemplative meditation, looked at the nature of self, mind, and reality, which is why Buddhism, um, whilst we, is it crucial to, to appreciate the Western traditions, spiritual traditions, but you can understand why Buddhist psychology fits in so well with modern psychology, or at least if I can find some sort of home there. So this, this led to his personal insight and awakening, the enlightenment at Bodhgaya, which is an amazing place to visit if you've not been there. And apparently at for, for, first he thought his discoveries were too subtle for anyone else, to, for people to kind of understand. And after 30 odd years I can appre- of trying to make sense of it all, uh, I can understand that. But apparently he relented and then, as you know, he went to Sarnath and delivered the, noble tr- the Four Noble Truths. So this is just to mention them. As in passing, not in passing, but not to focus on them too much. But the truth of suffering, because Buddhism is about suffering. Um, and as I'm getting older, it's interesting, and whole new, um, because when you're like 55 or 50, and my, my brother's a bit younger than me, you know, you're kind of looking forward to retirement. <laughs> then, then you get near retirement age, because you have this image, don't you, of retirement. Oh, I'm going to do all the things I wanted to do, you know. And then you get to that age of retirement, into your 60s, and then you start to discover a whole new wave of miseries of people getting ill and pain, dying, of course. And, and it becomes much more normal for people to be infirm in certain ways, which it's not so much when you're 50, 55, in my experience anyway. So the truth of suffering then is crucial, and of course it's not attractive. I remember I went to one of the... Um, Mystics and Scientists conferences at uh, Saint King Alfred's College, wasn't it, years ago, Winchester. And there was a venerable Samedo from Amaravati, American monk, wasn't he? Isn't he? Um, giving a talk on Buddhism and, he, and in his saffron robe. And he just said, well, actually, most of it's pretty depressing, really. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and he was advocating having a Morris Minor rather than a Mercedes. He obviously getting at the uh, Mahayanists a bit. Um, Morris Mine will do you all right as long as it gets you there. Anyway, so the truth of suffering and then the truth of causes of suffering and the truth of cessation, it is possible to see suffering and then there's the path to cessation. And so there's that quote, you should know sufferings, you should abandon origins, you should achieve cessations, you should meditate on paths, kind of off you go. There is a model... And the Buddhist way you live life is, a, I think, is a scientific model of the human condition. You've probably seen pictures of that. You may have them at home. But just to bring it a bit closer, it's a very, very graphic and very, very detailed view, which isn't time to go into now. And it does explain the, com- the human condition extremely well. Um, you know, the, the, the big face set there is the Lord of Death, as you know, I suspect, and it's the picture of psychic existence where 
there are different realms within the universe, of many, a universe of many worlds and many universes. There is the um, three causes, primary causes of our situation, which is ignorance, desire and aversion. And the beginning of the wheel, the cycle, you have a picture of an old woman, an old blind woman, interesting that they chose a woman as the the image there, but it's a person who is old and blind, in other words, completely helpless in a sense, and she represents ignorance. So ignorance, not understanding our situation, is the primary position. That's what sets the whole wheel. And then you have a, a through ignorance, you then create actions through our ignorance, not understanding the nature of reality, which then causes the image of the potter then. Action then creates imprints on the consciousness, and consciousness moves up and down in samsara. That's the monkey going up and down a tree. And then um, that gives rise then to birth in samsara, which is the ag- the basically body and mind. It's a picture of a, rowing bo- a person going on the, uh, on the rowing boat. And then that gives rise then to the six sense consci- the five sense consciousnesses and mental consciousness. And then there is contact um, with the world around us. And then there is uh, feeling, gives rise to feeling. That's a very graphic herald at uh, the Battle of Hastings image of um, a person with an arrow in your eye and so forth. And then, it, then, interestingly, it gives rise then to grasping and craving, which is, has a specific function in this wheel in that it is the grasping and craving we apparently have when we die, which again links to some of the other themes in the conference. What happens when we die? And those of you who know about the Tibetan tradition, which I'm sure is several of you, it very much is a, a, a tradition which focuses on, on the death time and focusing, focuses on gaining control and direction over one's consciousness at the death time. Maybe in the Victorian sense of to have a good death. Is, is very, very important. And so, that, um, that affects a man drinking beer and then the monkey grasping at fruit. And then you go back up to... I keep getting this image of Jessica Chess and her little baby went <laughs> through all this. Because then there's the image then of uh, becoming, which is a pregnant woman, and then a woman giving birth, which is birth, and then you go around the cycle into old age and death, and so it, so it, carries, so it carries on. It is very, very profound. It's a very, very profound model, and you can spend an awful long time <coughs> studying the various aspects. So those are the core elements of ignorance, aversion, and, um, and, attach, and attachment, desire, which set the whole thing in motion. And these are different realms of existence. Anyway... Don't need to focus too much on that. But the point is that we are trapped. Don't need to focus on too much of a detail, but we are trapped. And those are the six types of being in the different realms as well. And those, these are the different realms. But basically what the Buddha came up with then is a view of reality whereby we are in this cycle of endless suffering. There's no peace. Again, it's not an attractive model, is it? You, know, you can't kind of imagine selling it easily, really, you know, compared to other views, you know. It is very, very upsetting, you know. And, and um, for some reason, it's hard to, well, you can, you know, the therapist amongst you can speculate, but that having grandchildren is even more intense than experience in some ways than having children. When you have children, you, you immediately throw yourself, don't you, into the future. And I've heard quite a few people say that, oh, I, just, you know, I was just getting by and I had my own problems. Then you have children, immediately you see things into the future. Then you have grandchildren, you see things really further into the future. And the thought of them being in this situation is just, find it, I find it really unbearable. It is, it is horrible. 
And so the Buddha then came up with, I say it's counterintuitive in the sense that it is not really, you know, it's, it challenges the orthodoxy of the time. And the key point here, which is totally psychological, and I do think this is really, really brilliant. It is really smart. And so the problem then, from a Buddhist point of view, Buddhist psychological and philosophical point of view, is that our sense of I-ness, it's, which we have all the time, I'll give you some examples in a second, like, I'll go back to that in a second, like, what you th- what's going on now with you? Um... I thought this was going to be about something new, <laughs> interesting. Uh, so and so hasn't said hello to me yet. Uh, why haven't they given me a hug? Um, I could do the cup of coffee. When, when's when's um, when's tea time? When's uh, when's the evening meal? I'm looking forward to the wine. I don't, yeah, they have lots of wine here. I, I hear. Um, in other words, and it's an eye, isn't it? It's a sense of eyeness which is behind all our experiences when we want something. So I'll go back. And this deeply ingrained sense of a substantive sense of I, it guides so much of what's of our experience, day and night, when we're dreaming. You know, you're having a nightmare, and you wake up, and when you discover, oh, thank goodness it was a dream, you know. It was a Tommy Cooper joke, wasn't there? I woke up, woke up one morning, and uh, I dreamt I'd eating a huge marshmallow and I'd notice the pillow had gone. <laughs> and, but no, no, normally when we're dreaming, don't we, we're totally in there. It's totally, it's totally real. Absolutely real. And it's a strong sense of I-ness. And the point here is that our entrapment, according to this view, our entrapment in, psychological, in cyclic existence, samsara, it's purely psychological. Because we don't understand who we are or what we are. Because not only do we have this strong sense of I all the time, but it actually isn't real. What a discovery. What an incredible... What discovery could be better than that? It's not real. So the I which, which guides us... I want a drink. Oh, I want to have a chat with Ingrid, you know. Martin gave me a really good hug. That was really good. Bet he didn't give Ingrid a big. Well, he did, obviously. <laughs> David. But there's this iness all the time. If you if you track it, and that's the point of doing meditations. That iness is there all the time through everything we do, well, except when we're in the transpersonal realm, of course. And the point is that whenever this I arises, it's so deeply in our nature that we see it as instinctive, hence the counterintuitive bit, is that we are looking, we're feeding that, what is seen in Buddhist terms as a delusion, we're feeding it all the time by satisfying its wants and so on. And the point which the Buddha discovered then is that if you analyse you know, phenomenologically, if you analyse this I-ness, it really is a ghost. It is a ghost in the machine, if you like. It really isn't like the Wizard of Oz, you know. I took my granddaughter. It's a great excuse going to see all sorts of things. Little grand, went to see the Wizard of Oz. And, of course, as you know, the Wizard of Oz, when they, at the very end, when they've got the big wizard there, and he's all scary, isn't he? And the little dog pulls the, pulls the curtain away. And he's a little old man, isn't he? A little old man on the bike. You know, it's not as it appears. And yet it governs our our existence. And from a Buddhist point of view, it's governed our existence in this universe forever. And it will continue to do so unless we do something about it. That's the view. It's not a comfortable view. Then there is this grasping then gives rise then to his self-involvement. And I remember in those early Ornstein books, there was those little cartoons of Nasruddin, weren't there? The Sufi stories, weren't they? Sufi cartoons. But Nasruddin was... Pun? They were Sufi stories. Sufi stories. And there were pictures of him kind of... I remember one of them. He was outside his house looking for his keys. And he was asked, where did you drop them? David knows this. Uh, where did you drop them? Oh, in the house. Why are you looking out here? Oh, because the light's better. And so, from a Buddhist point of view, we're looking in the wrong place. 
And for happiness, that is, because the whole thing is about developing happiness, um, which is seen as a basic, basic human and what well, beings desire. All animals want comfort, don't they, as we do. So the path to happiness, then, is not chasing this I-ness and feeding it and, and worrying about it. It's actually in connecting with others. So, I've done this really, but what, what we're talking about, we all, is that it's, it's this inherent, substantive experience of I is what we're talking about. The sense of something solid. So if Kendall sort of shouts at me or something like, you know, you've messed up my stuff, then immediately that sense of I, oh, sorry, oh, whatever. It's something substantial. There's obviously a relative I because we are all here. We're all humans and all beings and so on. The relative I, in the same way that Ingrid's got a white jacket on and so on, that's obviously valid. What is not valid, according to Buddhist psychology and philosophy, is a sense of the I-ness, which is behind everything we do. And so, the, the, the gross examples, especially for transpersonal folk, you know, and though many of you are therapists, we get angry ourselves, we've been angry, or we've got clients, or we know people who are so angry, and they can do anything, I'm so angry. So the ignorance then of the I gives rise then to aversion or attachment, grasping, or I want that person, I can, it, my life will be meaningless without that person, or that thing, that car, or whatever it is. Or the more subtle things, like, you know, this is talks going on a bit, I thought it was going to be about something new and interesting, so-and-so hasn't said hello, could do the copy. Just check out for yourself when, because it's just a very, very practical down-to-earth psychology, really. Just check out for yourself, how are you typically feeling when you experience this sense of I-ness? So what's wrong with that then? It's just normal life, isn't it, being human? Absolutely. And so the point that the Buddha then said that this view of I-ness then is pervades all our existence, pretty much. And whenever we want something, something's going wrong, um, something's not fitting in right to whatever it is, it becomes quite solid, isn't it? That's the argument here. Or even if we just want something, oh, I must go back, where are my keys, whatever. However, when we're related or celebrating, the sense of i can be ecstatic. And then, of course, you move into a transpersonal experience, like being in love, then, and so forth, then, of course, the, that sense of a solid eye, it's more expanded, isn't it? You could argue then you get into the Wilbur levels, I guess, and so forth. But there's an I-ness maybe lighter. So transpersonal experiences will tend to be beyond or surpass this inherent I, or place it in suspension for a while. And you can relate that to relationships. You know, I'm a great fan of John Wellwood as well as uh, Alan Wallace. And um, John Wellwood's so good at describing relationships. Uh, one of his latest books, Perfect Love in Perfect Relationships, that, you know, when you meet someone you really connect with and it's all extant, it's transpersonal, isn't it? It's very much one of his themes. It's ecstatic and transpersonal. It's real love and it's the heart opening. And then, of course, after a while, you know, he was doing the washing up and all that kind of thing. I thought you were going to call in at Tesco's on the way back. And so that I-ness starts to re- reassert itself. So a Buddhist monk friend of mine who was um, a, a psychologist, and he said that, actually, to get into Buddhist psychology, you need to forget everything about Western psychology. And I do think there's something in that in that in, I think it's valuable to look at our own conditioning in terms of our professional lives and our personal lives in a sense as to what we think is the case. And in some ways there are advantages, maybe, uh, in not being psychologists and approaching Buddhist psychology, which is an interesting theme in itself. The enemy within, to quote uh, Margaret, our beloved Prime Minister of the 1980s, um, as a general principle, when this eye is manifest, then we're not at peace or deeply happy, usually. We well, could say always. But anyway, it's up to you. See, what I, mean. I guess you, most of you have got an eye. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've got, you left it all behind. 
It usually sets in motion a gross or subtle wanting which gives rise then to further grasping or aversion. Oh, I really fancy a Mars bar. Can't have a Mars bar. And so on. And so you go hunting for one or you steal one or something like that. Find someone walking by with a Mars bar and you pull it out of their hands. So when we're in temporary states of freedom from its experience of a substantive eyeness, as in deep concentration or mindfulness practice, which is so popular these days, or loving kindness, then it can be such a relief. So it's a very interesting view in a way, and as that saying, the old Tibetan Buddhist phrase, better not to have the itch than the pleasure of the scratching, which is very wise, better not to have the itch, Martin knows that, I'm sure, better not to have the itch than the pleasure of the scratching. So from a Buddhist point of view, all the pleasure we have in scratching, eating the Mars bars and so forth, or getting in touch with someone because we feel lonely, then it's going to arise again. That same desire is going, going to arise again. And you can tra- put it in behaviorist terms, can't you, in terms of reinforcement or whatever. But it's a very clear model of what it is to be human, what it is to be a living being. In, in our world. And, and if we are free of that i that peace, when I've done impromptu mindfulness introductory sessions, you know, at the college, and admin folk come and they say, you know, what people seem to want nowadays, you, you, correct me if I'm wrong, is peace, you know, some sort of peace, some sort of respite. And you really can see this wheel in a way, the wheel turning faster and faster, isn't it? As lives, people's lives become more and more complicated, more and more elaborate. And what are we trying to do with our existence moment by moment, year on year? You know, how society is developing, how it's changing. Interesting, then, mindfulness has taken off, as you know, on such a wide front. And you can see why, can't you? Mindfulness works. Why does it work? Because it's the nature of our mind. I met Alan Wallace years ago. He said, you know, the natural state of the mind when it's concentrated is blissful. That's our natural endowment as human beings. The other aspect which there isn't time to to go into um, is also, of course, is that if this I-ness is an illusion and you can get a real start to begin to get a sense of that because that I-ness can't be found anywhere... And it's a fundamental principle of Buddhist philosophy, isn't it? That nothing substantial is findable anywhere. And I find find it interesting, for example, these debates on Englishness and Britishness, Scottishness, that matter. You can't find a root. It doesn't mean there's nothing there. It doesn't mean there's nothing there. (laughs) Um, But it doesn't mean that it's an emptiness. It doesn't mean that there is absolutely zero there. What it means is that things are not findable. So when the Dalai Lama was going around the CERN Institute, you know, in Switzerland, the accelerator, nuclear accelerator, apparently he did say to them, he says, you do realize you're never going to find anything absolutely, uh, fundamentally, there, because that's the nature of reality. And it's a huge scientific discovery that reality is not substantial. It's not as it appears. As to me, that's an f- incredible scientific discovery. It's a fan- you know, what could be a bigger scientific discovery than that? Things are not as they appear. And they are not, there's no, nothing substantial from their own side in anything that appears, anything that functions. And that applies to ourselves. It doesn't mean that it's a zero doesn't mean it's a, not a nihilism. Hence, Buddhism is a middle way, isn't it, between absolutism and, not, and nihilism, if you like. And the fact that things are not as they appear means that we can actually free ourselves if we discover the, the, the reality of our nature of i of who I am and who others are and the world in which we exist. There is a, there's a way out. It's a bit like, you know, that series, The Prisoner. You know, you remember it from the 60s. It's been revamped, hasn't it? With Patrick McGowan. And people were having a relatively nice life in Port Mirian, wasn't it? In North Wales, Central Wales. And, but they were, they were imprisoned. They were basically imprisoned. And the prisoner, number six, wasn't he? He could see that. So it's a bit like that. You know, we could be having a pleasant time. Of course, most people in this world are not having a pleasant time at all. 
So we're not fixed here forever. That's the good news. Because we misunderstand reality. So you have these two truths in Buddhism. That, and it's so, it kind of seems very clear really, that every, if things existed as they appeared, then they could, the world could not function. If you're all sat there and I'm here and the walls are around, as they appear, which is inherent, isn't it? Inherent means existing from their own side. Then nothing could interact with anything else. Because our experience of reality all the time, no matter what we're investigating, is of something which is out there and inherently existent. Something which is substantial from its own side. And the Buddhist view is that when you analyse any phenomenon, no matter how microscopic or subatomic or how gross or universes or planets or whatever, when you examine any phenomenon at all, including ourselves, it is not as it appears. It's unfindable. It's not findable. Therefore, it's not there as it appears. Therefore, reality is not as it appears. What this means then is that, we, hence you can see why the Buddhists go on about ignorance and that the world is an illusion. It's here. It functions. And the other side of the coin is that it functions because of dependent arising. The Dalai Lama again said, a Buddhist slogan is dependent origination, dependent arising. Interdependence is a Buddhist, as our Buddhist slogan. Because everything is interconnected. That's what science has shown us, hasn't it? But things can only function because they are not substantially existent. Nothing could interact with anything else if it existed as it appeared. Because it'd be like, you know, un, because we experience the world as one hand, one hand there. Because the two hands aren't as they appear, they're able to clap, they're able to make a sound and all the rest of it. So what I'm saying here is that the Buddha is a scientist as far as I'm concerned. And by analysing the nature of reality outside and in, as well as inside then, he shows the integration, which is what Alan Wallace was looking for as a teenager in California in the 1960s, there's an integration then between the scientific world of interdependent causality across many, many disciplines and the transpersonal. Because the other key point in the Buddhist view, of course, is that consciousness, consciousness is a... Which I haven't emphasized. Consciousness is a, is a, is, is a distinct realm of existence. It's a non-material realm of existence. So there's primarily consciousness and then according to the wheel the different components of the wheel of life and through ignorance, through grasping at substantiality it creates it creates in the moment the whole cycle. So you know yourself we can create samsara in any moment. We can sit there kind of mindful and be kind of composed and so in a sense samsara is in suspension and it's naturally pleasant, isn't it, being mindful? Then, of course, you then think, oh, I want a Mars bar, as I said, oh, I want a drink, or oh, I'll phone Ingrid, or uh, whatever, or oh, i get in touch with Martin. And then it sets the whole cycle going, I want, I, I, substantial I, then wants to get in touch with Martin and say, oh, where is he, where's his number? Oh, he never gave me his number. And so the whole cycle of wanting and desiring then, which throws you out of your composure, and then sets up a whole wheel. Oh, where's his number? Who knows his number? Oh, David might, David might know it. Oh, we're always forgetting. Oh, it's so annoying. I really want to get in touch with him now. And then you get really frustrated. And, you know, and the whole cycle of existence is thrown into action. Again, having grandchildren is very, very helpful, because you see little children, don't you? I'm sure as Jess knows... Floods of tears, and then three seconds later, it's okay again. Floods of tears, it's okay again. And so the cycle is kind of speeded up. I wonder how we appear to Buddhas, to enlightened beings, really. You know, because um, our world, my world, anyway, goes up and down like that. So, and it's very, just a very interesting point, I think, is that the Buddhist view of the nature of reality and the scientific view of the nature of, of causality and independence, to my mind... Well, it's not my mind at all, is it? Uh, to, the, to the Buddhist point of view, are totally complementary. 
And if they didn't, um, things weren't, if things existed as they appeared, then the world could not function, the universe could not function. So, coming on to the last lap, really. So, what you need then, which again is not in a very attractive <laughs> viewpoint, thinking of some it's all rather depressing, isn't it? Is that we need to then to develop a wish from a Buddhist psychological point of view to get out of the cycle of suffering. And that has to be such a powerful drive to get out of the prison, uh, like number six in Port Miriam, um, to get out of that cycle. Because basically there's no future in it from a Buddhist point of view. It's just going to go on and on and on and on. Like that, like that advert of years ago for fridges. And this realisation and a renunciation or definite emergence is a rather more attractive version. is so crucial. A crucial foundation to want to, to get out of it. You could argue it's a bit like the, 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 the descent in the Wilbur model from going up or down to um, more subtle levels of being. But basically this renunciation is, a, is, is really a sense, I just want to be out of this. I want to get out of here. And to me it's a very demanding one because it means facing up to lots and lots of aspects of one's reality. And in particular, and relevant to our time, this is something Alan Wallace mentioned in this interview, he really sees the, the world on a kind of cusp. I've heard Kabat-Zinn, the mindfulness uh, expert, say the same, have a kind of Star Wars view of reality at the moment. We could go one way or the other. We could become completely dominated by technology, or we could develop higher levels of, of awareness, of mindfulness, and, and so forth, and self-awareness. And the point is... And the way Alan Wallace put it very well, he said, well, we've, you know, if we're going to have 12 billion people on the planet in the not-so-distant future, and then, of course, the numbers, numbers have doubled, haven't they, in, that, in, that, in my lifetime on the planet, if they're going to double again, he says, well, you cannot find happiness. I think this is really neat, actually. You cannot find happiness, then, in external things. Cars and videos and Apple computers. <laughs> <laughs> notebooks and so on and um, we can't find happiness in external things because the planet cannot sustain it which is interesting, I've never heard that viewpoint kind of so obvious isn't it but I've never heard it put so, clear, cl so clearly therefore we have to turn inwards for our well-being for our happiness and of course that's the whole Buddhist path and all the contemplative traditions isn't it that we that you know, the divine within, as, as David's such an expert and so on, it's within that we have to find contentment and happiness. We can't. We can't find it in Peruna, Ingrid. <laughs> not forever. No, it's all right. It'll be all right. So don't worry. It's not, not that bad. <laughs> but we can't find it in consumption. Yes. Yes, I did say a couple of years ago that Peruna was proof of the existence of God for some people. But... <laughs> Uh, part of Marks and Spencers. Anyway, so, um, so with the increasing demands on our little world, then we have to look for fulfillment and happiness within ourselves. And of course, as you know, the whole the way the, the economies are structured, aren't they, is to create desire. Create desire where, where there wasn't any for our parents' generation. And, um, and there is more and more, even more and more the younger you go, isn't it? So if we've been in, in samsara, this is cyclic existence since beginningless time, how deep must our conditioning be? This is the model. We've been in this predicament for, forever. How deep must the conditioning be to kind of look outside ourselves? And again, be honest, you know, of ourselves, you know, where do we look for fulfillment? Is it a relationship? Is it to create something, we have various projects things to do there's these lists aren't they that young people have you know, a hundred things to do before the age of 30, or whatever they are, you know, bungee jumping in New Zealand and all the rest of it and so it gives us a sense and to be compassionate to ourselves maybe to see how difficult it is to turn things around and of course transpersonal psychology as I said in my 
chair role at the, uh, at the great Druid Council of the BPS when they're going on about statutory regulation and clinical stuff. And I said, by the way, you know, mindfulness, we're the experts on that. All right? You know, transpersonal, we, we, we are. We're, we're the guys who know about mindfulness and that kind of thing, which has become the buzzword, hasn't it? And so anyway, it uh, lightened the moment. I didn't put it as, as acerbically as that, but I did say, you know, we do actually know about these areas, you know, yet we're not, not allowed to have a say unless we're in, uh, in the, got the right badge. <clears throat> anyway, um, and of course, one possible aspect of the present society is that overconsumption... People are discovering, aren't they, that overconsumption isn't a path to happiness. And as you, as you know, the examples of people who have so much things materially discover that there's still something lacking. So for me, then, this is a journey to the centre of the heart, our inner life, rather than Jules Verne's journey to the centre of the exter- uh, material world, the centre of the earth. So... That the key thing about the Buddhist path then was that through extensive self-observation over years and so on, it becomes apparent then that our own contentment, and this is what we're looking at, our own happiness is due to this process of grasping at an eye and then cherishing it. And I've worked with this for, don't, for a long time because you know, psychology, counselling, self-cherishing is what you're encouraging and what you're developing. But what we're talking about here is that if there is no substantive I, then we're a field of awareness, aren't we? We're a field of awareness. So what do we do? What are we about? If we're not chasing, satisfying this I, and so you really realise then it makes sense then to cherish others, not as a compensation, but looking (laughs) looking at other people then, and caring about their welfare, because you kind of sorted it out for yourself by not chasing this eye, which is an illusion. Otherwise you could find it. Even though it keeps appearing, it's not findable. Hence, it's an illusion. So we then um, realize then that from our own contentment, we can actually find great meaning in our lives by caring for others, cherishing others. Because they haven't, they're not, they haven't re- they've still got the problems, still got the difficulties. So there's a sense of refuge then. That, oh, this, this makes sense to me. And what I need then is to look at the nature of reality, the nature of the self, and so on. And it does raise a question then of who or what am I? Very, very fundamentally, what am I? If I'm not this I, and of course there's great threats, aren't there, in a sense of... Discovering that this I is an illusion, it's just a creation of an ignorant mind from a Buddhist point of view, then what have I been chasing all these years? I remember Trumper in one of his books referred to the cosmic joke. And I uh, have to look back, look, and look back at that and see what he was getting at. But he talked about a cosmic joke. Trumper was a very interesting Tibetan uh, teacher from the 70s and so on. It raises the question then of who and what am I? How best should I spend my time in this world? Oops. And so the training then then is to cultivate positive states of mind and really stop the wheel by seeing through and letting go of ignorance, attachment, aversion, jealousy, doubt and so forth. All these traps which come up in the mind which throw us into grasping at something, not being content, not being satisfied. And so, as you know, all the traditions of Buddhism and the Christian traditions and others and the Sufis and so on, and the Hindu tradition, great emphasis on loving kindness, because loving kindness then is a great way of transcending that I-ness, isn't it? Or putting it into suspension. And in the Buddhist tradition, there's, there's the Brahma Viharas, the practices of loving kindness, <coughs> compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity, which if you practice the Brahma Viharas, the heavenly abodes, you really do attain a paradise in this world. Those of you who practice these methods, you know they work. That's the point about these methods, is that they, they work if, you put them in, if we put them into practice. Mindfulness works, loving kindness works. 
in the Mahayana tradition, which is the Tibetan tradition, then the whole point, then the whole Bodhisattva tradition, then is to develop such a, a, an intention to care for others that you, you other beings' welfare then is, takes total precedence. It dominates one's whole being, and that state of mind, which is seen as a finer state of mind, really, in the Mahayana tradition, is bodhicitta. And paradoxically, one cares for oneself by caring for others. By reaching out for others, then, of course, the I, in a sense, is suspended. And if we see through it and let it go, then we're really free of it. So we've got nothing to hide. There's nothing to protect. There's nothing to cultivate. So therefore, we we reach out, connect with others, and we benefit them. That's the principle. And we're also benefiting for ourselves because we're staying in a state of love or compassion. And just think about it. How much time have we spent today thinking about others? And how much time have we spent today thinking about ourselves? Oh, it's a long way, isn't it? Long way. Gosh, oh no, diversion. I don't want to go. Gosh, I'm hungry. Hope I make it for lunch. Um, And so forth, you know. How much of our time, honestly, is spent uh, caring and, and focusing on, on others. and That's why, now you know, that's why I've said, Jess, is that every monk or nun who gets ordained should be given a new, a new baby. <laughs> to care, cause it's the biggest, you know, because you have to, don't you? Usually, yeah. yeah. I bet you feed, feed her every day, don't you? <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, yes. So, um, and it's interesting looking at our, our, ourselves, which do, it doesn't mean that you don't look after ourselves. It's not about that. It's that preoccupation, that whole centre of gravity. That's what's meant by self-cherishing. And so it makes sense to me now that when you talk about, when the, the Buddhists talk, Mahayana Buddhists talk about self-cherishing as a big problem, it's not a contradiction. It's actually, a, it's a way of looking after ourselves. It's not about you know, being negative to ourselves at all. And by f- following a false sense of I, we're prone to excessive self-absorption. And we know that, don't we, in depression. When we've had bad times ourselves, we're totally engrossed, aren't we, in our own state. Self-preoccupation, me, 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 me. And the point here is that this i this sense of i is so deeply ingrained in our psyche. So we could actually be spiritually very highly developed, We can be spiritually highly developed, but not be free of samsara, not be free of psychic existence. As long as we have this subtle sense of I, we could be very clairvoyant, we could be wonderfully saint-like, we could be incredibly um, noble and uh, and accomplished in many ways. Maybe have have fantastic concentration, do all sorts of magical things maybe. But if we've got that sense of I-ness, that grasping, again, it's it's a grasping at an inherent I-ness, then... And it feels intuitively right because we spend all our time protecting it. That's the point. And, but by letting it go or seeing through it, then it is such a freedom. That's the whole point. So the last little bit now. So if it, one gains an, an understanding of a sense of an inherently existent I really is an illusion created by an ignorant mind, it radically challenges how one regards oneself. What, what am I? Such insight may be initially quite disturbing or maybe fantastically liberating. What have I been worrying about all this time? We might ask ourselves, so what has the process of self-grasping, self-preoccupation, self-cherishing done for our sense of well-being and happiness? By way of comparison, what does caring and cherishing for others do for our well-being and happiness? You know, very simple experiments, aren't they? We can, empirical exercises we could undertake of ourselves. According to Buddhist psychology, cherishing others is the royal road, to quote from Freud, if you like, to personal happiness, fulfillment and meaning, again, for the benefit of all. So cherishing others is the way, especially in the Mahayana tradition, is the way through. The Mahayana tradition then has this great technology, if you like, and literature in training. It is actually unutterably brilliant it is phenomenally clever, very, very smart. 
the stages you go through to move, to move your center of gravity from yourself, from self-preoccupation to caring for others is it's a work of genius. It really is a work of genius. And so I mentioned Alan Wallace there, feeling very you know, dischuffed. Yeah, it's called low jong or mind training in the Tibetan tradition. Alan Wallace, a renowned writer and practitioner in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, said he was very frustrated that the seemingly irreconcilable two worlds of his Protestant Christian upbringing and the world of science at the University of California. And um, so he went and became a Tibetan Buddhist monk, didn't he, for several years, and he's a very experienced practitioner, and then did a PhD in physics, following in Martin's footsteps, or <laughs> vice versa. So we know Charles Darwin then was a natural scientist par excellence. And some are, what I'm saying here, nothing new. The Buddha was a natural scientist, is what I'm saying, in the sense of being a subjective empiricist, to quote Professor Fontana. Space in mind, that was. Yeah, with John Crook, who I think is a, uh, yeah, a very special pioneer in this area. And, and Alan Wallace. Because and, Alan Wallace has written a lot on subjectivity, as a valid method of inquiry. He's very, very good on all that and so, that and so forth. So our human endowment then, this is it, our human endowment then of reason, because we're good at that, wisdom, we've got that built in, love and compassion, we've got that built in. So the whole thing's built into it, isn't it? Provides us with the opportunity to follow in their footsteps. We become our own scientists, if you like. We become our own subjective empiricists. And to add our own chapter to the ever unfolding human story for the benefit of all living beings. And the final thought again, uh, thought for the moment, better not to have the itch and the pleasure of the scratching. So thank you very much. There we go. We've met her. <laughs> so? That was excellent. Was it? Thank you. Good. Yes, very good design. <laughs> it's very important. Really strong feelings about the the rightness of love, wisdom, and compassion. Yeah, you know that that helps everything and makes life mm. better. And makes life better. <laughs> and, um, mm. and also helping other people. But what struck me was if mm. the uh, sorry, it's not working. I see. It wasn't. It wasn't. But it is now. It's not, not Can it. you? Can you hear it now? It's not inherently working. It's not inherently working. <laughs> the, the thing that mm. struck me was, if the eye doesn't exist, uh, isn't when, real. When it appears if the eye isn't form, real. the substantive eye, yeah. Right. Mm. Oh, so I've misunderstood. So if other people are eyes... Again. That are, I was thinking, if other yeah. people are eyes... Yes. ...and they're not real, and we give our attention to them... Right. It just left me with that question. Yes. What's, what's actually happening? Right. And um, that's all, really. I just thought it was an interesting question. <laughs> right. Yes, it is. Yes, it's, it's, it's a sense of, a, of an inherent eye. That's the that's point, which under, under analysis doesn't, doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Yes, are there any questions? We've got a couple of minutes, haven't we, Anthony? Um, Ingrid? Um, yes, in the same uh, vein as you just pointed out. Um, so if, if I cherish others, there are various ways of doing this. Um, but is there, is there a danger that uh, the identification actually shifts from just me to everybody else? And then, you know, I, I feel suffering and so on, and it's, it's due to identifying with something that's not me, but it doesn't make a difference. Um, so in practical terms, um, how, would someone, uh, how would someone do this without uh, making something uh, more difficult for them? Yeah, uh, it's a very, very good question. And um, because um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very, very good question, is that in terms of normal I-ness, compassion is really uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, it can be very, very painful. So if you have, you know, like with a child, um, your own child is suffering, so many parents will say, oh, I'd, I'd do anything. To, uh, ex- uh, I would exchange myself for them. Oh, I'll, I'll take it on. 
And the point there, the interesting point is that from... This is, this is the answer, if you're not the answer, but it's, it is a reply to your excellent question, which I've also asked myself, is that the, when one keeps the I-ness, then it get, we get really frustrated or we get really down about it because of that I-ness. Whereas if one is actually focusing on the distressed child and you're doing what you can, but also from a Buddhist point of view, which is a kind of a bigger picture. There's a bigger picture one can bring in to a suffering in others is that there's a way out of samsara. There's a way out of it. One can't put it right, but one can... Fr- by freeing oneself as one, one's own self-grasping, then one is actually empowered to do what one can do for someone else. Because we're not always kind of... It's a bit like you know, going into a ward where there's horrible diseases. You know, we, don't want to, we don't want to catch it. We don't want to catch anything because of our self-grasping. So it kind of, it kind of disables us in a way. But it, it, is a really good, it is a really good question, which I say I have asked myself. We, could, we just don't want to feel overwhelmed. There was one of those studies done in that Matthew Ricard book, wasn't it? The Lama in the Lab studies, which they did. He's a French Tibetan monk, isn't it? His book on, his book on happiness. And it was in the dialogues of a Dalai Lama and the scientists, the mind and life folk, did a series of experiments and there was this, it's called Lama in the Lab. <laughs> uh, and they presented this, um, as it turned out to be a, Fre- a French monk, with um, you know, scenes of suffering, if you like. And actually his, well- his sense of well-being actually went up because they were, they were measuring it. It actually went up. So it, in other words, he was more and more empowered and, f- and liberated because he actually had a way of dealing with it, which was to go beyond the self, presumably, but also there is actually a way through, ultimately, not instantly, but, but, but ultimately. That's an interesting set of sto- stories. Heckman did some studies, didn't, didn't he, on the startle response and found that this monk could actually inhibit the startle response, which Heckman, American researchers into nonverbal communication, thought was un- impossible, but he, he, he was able to control that. So it was looking at the power of meditation, really. But we did do that bit on compassion. Yeah. Uh, Peter Fennick, thanks Hi, very Peter. much indeed. I very much enjoyed that. That oh. was lovely. But the current neuroscience of the reward system yeah. shows that one of the most powerful rewarding acts are altruistic acts and compassionate acts. And so it looks as if if we do these things, then we get a huge kick from it yes, ourselves. Yes, absolutely. That's a really good point, isn't it? So we're kind of... Again, it's built into us, in a sense. Yeah, that's, that's excellent to, to know that. Thank you. It was just um, something... To, uh, the, the, uh, I saw a presentation about, um, about quant- qualitative levels of happiness, and they've done studies about um, kind of what would produces and they kind of is negligible when it's more and more things and oh, right. and then it's it's slightly marginally more when it's kind of like seeking out experiences for yourself yeah. and the only significant in, yeah. increase of long term happiness was altruistic acts for other people something greater than oneself yeah. basically so which also yeah. brings meaning doesn't it which is a big but, yeah. gap but, in modern yeah. life perhaps. Yeah. Uh, but, um, mm. uh, anyway, I'll let someone else. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hello, I'm Davis. Um, there was a programme on television last night, which I only just oh, got I part of it. That. And it was about uh, five uh, popular people or famous people, all in their 70s, 80s, who'd become quite ill. Right. And the out- did anybody see it? No. And the outcome was that when they brought these people together for one week, that their physiology, psychology, mm. and well-being increased. Also, the- they were able to walk again, and they didn't walk before because they'd become quite ill, because right. they were helping each other. Yes. And that was the, uh, really the, the outcome of the research that they did that mm. week. If you can catch it on, it's a bit like, isn't it? Those older studies, aren't they, David? Of um, 
um, people just caring for plants, isn't it? Oh, yes. You know, that just caring for something, and the pets, of course, it sure. reduces stre- heart sure. stress. Measurable changes. Yes. Mm. Yes, they had pets as well. Pets, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's an interesting one. Oh, it's Martin, right. <laughs> Thanks, Igor. Oh, it's sorry. I almost feel tempted to do some uh, an Elvis impression or something. Um, it was just one thing that just struck me as almost a summary of everything you've said, or at least it summarised it for me. Because uh, a question you might ask is, if the eye isn't real, what is real? And it seemed to me the answer is relationship is real. Yes. Between people, between us and the environment, mm. even just to talk about relationship, it, it, the the whole idea of two, it's not two separate things relating. Relationship, just full stop. Yeah. That is what's real. Because that's what, 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 what's happening, isn't it? Mm. Which we can't stop. Because that's the nature of everything. And compassion yeah. is a, a recognition yeah. of that and an expression of that relationship yeah. in caring for the other. Yeah. I guess it's a reaching beyond that yeah. sense of a substantial eye, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah compassion yes, is embodying relationship, isn't mm. it? Yeah. So in that sense, it, the, the mystical traditions then make sense, don't, if you like, from this perspective, because you are opening your awareness to the universe or to the divine or infinitely, mm, which is closer to reality. That's the point here, isn't it? That here is that the, from this perspective, if you like, the closer we are to reality, then we are content because we're actually not disturbing reality with our delusions of ignorance and so on. Yes, and it's the idea of separateness that's delusion. Uh, which is a delusion. Uh, there's which a lovely quote. Einstein had a view on I was just it? about to say Einstein's oh. quote. Uh, <laughs> he did it that, was, didn't he? We've tuned you, into the same thing. It's something like uh, the, uh, Einstein's quote was the idea that we're all separate. Yes. It's a kind of optical delusion of yes. consciousness. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right. It's amazing that you were leaping to the same quote at the same yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> we're obviously in good relationship at the moment. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Right. Thank you for a lovely talk. I really had a lot of insights, as you were saying. All oh, right. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, the you, things I'd heard before, you know, but it was—you know it all. Your anyway. your deep practice was helping it sink in because it's you embody. You're, you're really working so hard to embody these things. So, thank you so much for your sincerity. All right. Thank you, matey. <laughs> <clears throat> Rupert Tao. I just, oh, this Rupert. is just an association, really. Um, when you were talking about Apple. There is something about the seduction of the consumerist imagery yeah. these days, which is almost like an alternative religion. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking, um, mm. I think it was about four months ago, when the iPad came out, there was a picture in The Economist of mm. Steve Jobs, who looked like Moses, really? holding tablets yes. Yes. of the it's iPad. It's true, though. And, and Apple mm. is, is such a good example of mm. they're so subtle and almost monastic yeah. in the way they yes. present. And then they present the their nuggets, and the, don't yes. they, from their contemplations, from their. Uh, so I mean, I only raise this mm. because it, the more that, mm. I mean, the important things that Martin and you have been yes. talking about and others, that there's the canter that it's getting more and more subtle. Yeah. in the seductiveness for desire as well yes. in the world. And so one has to really compete Absolutely. with Absolutely. That. And that's the... I remember it was ahead of um, Quicksave. <laughs> Quicksave supermarkets, where apparently things are kind of in boxes or whatever. And he said that play, people like Tesco's and so on, they build their supermarkets like cathedrals. And, of course, shopping malls are cathedrals, aren't they? And if you, like Martin and me, follow football on television, you know, like the Champions League and so on, the, 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 the introductory music, it, it's cathedral-like, isn't it? It's all kind of soaring, soaring crescendos. It really is, you know. This is a real, yes, it is a, 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 you know, a, um, a divine experience. So the opposition are getting better at it, I guess. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking of that actually. Uh, when, uh, it's all foretold in Genesis. It was Eve eating the forbidden fruit of the apple. Yeah, that was the downfall of humanity, and mm. so it is. It has come. So it has come to pass. It was interesting. I was flickering to something like that, and half looking at <laughs> David. But almost you start to think of another agency, don't you? Kind of seducing the. Uh, yeah, exactly. You so Steve better. Jobs is clearly Beelzebub. <laughs> yes, you're good at spotting these antichrist figures, aren't you? 
<laughs> you've, you've had a few now. <laughs> yes, your, your purpose in life. Mm. Yeah, Nicola Richter. Yeah, Hi, thank Nicola. you very much, uh, yeah. Malcolm. It was uh, very interesting uh, what you said on this topic of the eye, and and yeah. uh, I would be interested to hear from you whether you believe or think or maybe experience that the eye can really vanish, because for for me it is. The eye is always there, even when we've mm. talked uh, now the about in the yeah. different comments. The relative eye is always the, there because that's you know you're you're there and I'm here and Ingrid's here and so on. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a subs it's the trick is teasing out what what one is actually negating, and it's that sense of a, a, an eye eyeness that can be quite a lengthy contemplation related to tease out that eyeness. It arises when we're under threat or if things are going wrong. I, I, and, you know, it's, and it's such a deep kind of holding, often in the heart area. So it's, it's really challenging the reality, if you like, that that presents to us. Because it presents, presents the reality that I've got to do something about protecting the I. We, not you, is it Nicola? Nicola, yeah. Nicola, not you, Nicola or Malcolm or Ingrid. Yeah. But what, mm. what I thought is, even yeah. uh, when we are saying, so in order to overcome suffering, then, yeah, I'm helping others. And I mean, in my own research on meaning in life, I found oh, that right. people experience meaning in life in doing something for others. Yes. And people who experience more meaning in life, they had less neurot neuroticism mm. and so on. Mm. So in that way, I can say, yes, that's really great. I should do that. And I should, yeah, I want to overcome suffering. Yeah. And then there's a the question, who wants to overcome the suffering, which I, yeah, yeah. because why can't I say, okay, I suffer, mm. okay. That's developing the wisdom side, isn't it? So you're developing the wisdom, which is, I guess is what you discover when you do contemplate meditation, so and is a you know, sort of field of awareness, whatever, in the heart, or the feeling of love and compassion in the heart. And then you can kind of experience that the I-ness is kind of a, it's a super... You know, it's, a, it's a superstructure on, on top of that, which normally we lock into, from a Buddhist point of view, it's simply through habit, habit over, over, over time, that we lock into that I-ness. And so we then, um, for example, in, when you're you know, having a conversation with a close friend and you kind of feel that connection with someone, a kind of heart connection, don't you? And then that's very kind of clear. But if basically you're fed up with your friend, you know, because they've let you down or whatever, then there's that, and if we're not, isn't aware of it, there's that i -ness, oh you, and there's that feeling then of me being over here and you being over there, or Martin being over there or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that sets the whole kind of wheel in, in motion. So it's, dis it's discovering then that the, there's the awareness of what we are, which is free of that I, and then we kind of, and spot it when we, when, when the whole wheel of samsara it kicks in again when we grab onto this sinus. It's that instinctive reaction of grabbing onto the sinus, which then sets a chain of aversion or uh, um, attachment or whatever it is in, in motion. So there's two two things going on. The relative I, because we are, you know we are human beings, um, is a label then which we validly attach to ourselves, you know, Ingrid, David and uh, Mike and so on. That's perfectly valid. What the Buddhist psychology and philosophy is challenging then is a sense of i which Ingrid may have, or I certainly have, when things start to go wrong. It's that substantive i which we're challenging. It's n there's no negation of what's actually appearing, as, as Martin said. It, it's all relate interrelated anyway. There's no negation of that. It's just challenging that dynamic of the of the I ness of a substantive I, which actually doesn't is, the, doesn't actually exist as it appears in, from in, this view. In that and way, I, the arising which causes conflict, then, or pardon, the the arising of the I which causes yeah, conflict. Yeah, substantive that's what you mean. I. Yeah, yes, right. is is the is the problem. Yeah. I'm going to say okay. thank you again, Malcolm. Okay, and I'm you. going to leave with something that Peter uh -huh. said that makes, I ask, always ask the question, is there really such a thing as altruism? If you get pleasure from helping people, is it really altruistic? I don't see the problem, I don't see the problem of the question. I mean, I, 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 yes. Yeah. 
But anyway, brilliant. Mm. Thank you very much. And thank so, you all yeah. for yes. being such a great audience as usual. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um,